Hi, it's your Trev. Welcome to my vlog. This is another one of those your top questions answered videos. So in the last video I did, the question posed to me was, did I believe that it might be better to braze in a patch panel as opposed to weld it in? That was the last video. In this video, I've got plenty more of your top questions answered. Now, I may not be answering your direct question because I do get inundated with loads and loads of questions, so I've whittled it down to the most popular questions asked. Hope you enjoy the video. A much asked question, should I use a hammer or should I use a spoon? And what should I use these for? When's the best time to use which tool? Well, there's no real sort of wrong or right answer to this, but I'll give you what I do. So I've got two spoons that I use, and these are essentially files. This one's had the teeth polished out of it, so it's nice and smooth, and this one retains its teeth. So I would use this one if I was taking out a deep dent in something, so I put the dolly up underneath the dent. Sounds counterintuitive, but I actually hit this on top of the dent and uh, this action brings the dent out. Now because it's got teeth on it, it grips the material each side of the dent, puts compression on the steel and actually shrinks it down a bit. If you can appreciate if you've ever just hit a dent out with a hammer, you hit the dent out and there's a dent sticking back out the other way. This is because the material stretched. If you do it this way, you've got more chance of putting compression on the steel, shrinking the steel down and popping that dent out without there being any stretch. So that's what I use the tooth one for. The smooth one is a little bit more like a hammer then. So if I was um, doing something like this, I've uh, just shrank this edge here to sort of make this roof corner section or a cab corner or whatever. So I could use this for dressing this up afterwards. So I would use a spoon for more sort of raising and smoothing. And if I had like um, a dent sticking up out this way, so I've got like a dent there, I could place this over a fairly flat part of the dolly and then just dress it down with a hammer like this. So that's got rid of that little dent there. And I wouldn't necessarily use the spoon for that. So it's all ripply there where the teeth have gone in. So I could um, easily dress that up with this by just supporting it with a dolly. And and that has smoothed that out. So I would use the hammer for taking out the high spots and I'd use the spoon for basically just ironing out the ripples and uh, bringing up any low spot. I can appreciate this is a fairly oversimplified version, but I've got to keep the video down a little bit. And um, I'm sure I'll talk about this some more in the future. So if I was going to put, say, an edge on a panel, so if I wanted to sort of beat a lip into it, I could do something like this, you see. Turn that round. So I wanted to put a little lip in that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick up the spoon and start doing this. I would See, I've got a nice, I've got a nice sharp lip. Um, I would find, I would find the spoon a little bit vague for that kind of. Thing I was trying to do and I can hammer it all the way around once I started. Okay so now I've got a right angled lip there and I put that in with a hammer very very quickly and I wouldn't have been able to do that with a spoon, if I was sort of putting a door skin on, of course, um, the door skin with that, I had a lip like that, and I would basically support it with a dolly underneath, and again, just use the hammer, tapping the hammer in, bringing that back round again. I could fold that lip around the dolly, 
Put the curved dolly in there. So I formed that round with a hammer and dolly, just tapped it round with my panel hammer around a dolly, and I managed to keep a fairly accurate width. Problem is, what's happened is, is it straightened the panel out. This is actually supposed to be curved here. So I formed this nice curve of my shrinker, and it's now gone straight. So what I need to do is I need to put some shrinks just here. So I've got my handmade little shrinking device that puts tucks in um, so if you haven't got a shrinker stretcher you could always do something like this and I need the curve to be here and if I just put some tucks in there with this this is just an old tile cutter that I modified so that I could just shrink edges like this Especially when you can't get to places because oftentimes when stuff's actually on the vehicle and it's stretched out of shape, you can't get a shrinker stretcher in there to do anything. And this tool allows me to put some tucks in there which has brought that back round. See? It's now curved more. And what I can do quite simply is I can grip this each side, so if I just find a nice bit of flat, strong steel, I can grip this each side and then tap those tucks down. Because it's gripped both sides, it can't spread out very easily. So there we go, a lip hammer and dollied round homemade shrinking pliers, planished it out, grinded it up with a 50 grit grinding disc and just gone over with a cleaning strip wheel just to make it look the business. Only took about 10 minutes to do this. No big deal, no specialist tools needed, which is useful if you haven't got the funds to buy them and you don't mind sort of putting yourself out a little bit, making your own stuff. For the people that wanted to know about removing the shrinking marks because that deep throat shrinker I've got did leave some pretty bad marks. Can they be removed? Hopefully this answers your question. And for the people that are going to say, ah, well, you've removed a lot of the material from the outside edge. Very, very true. Don't forget, we've shrank it down. So this will have increased in thickness after it's been shrank. Okay, yeah, I've removed 
quite a bit of surface steel to remove the marks and polish it up but obviously you've got to be a bit sensible about this kind of thing um, I've said many times in the past it's pointless to relentlessly polish a piece of metal that you're going to paint I don't mind leaving a few marks in it myself I'm putting a bit of filler in a few things modern fillers don't shrink like they used to our modern paint products are pretty good at hiding a multitude of sins and not shrinking either so hopefully this just goes to kind of show what you can achieve perhaps I'll just measure with my caliper the thickness of the material around here and up here where it hasn't been shrank so in the end worked area what did we start off with 0 0.80 this is 20 gauge steel would expect it to be 0.90 but for where I got this piece of steel from anyway uh, let's see what well, it is here right, 0.87 0.83 0.80 so there we have it I shrank it down it gained thickness I've polished it up and I've got rid of that extra thickness we had gained if this was a pressed steel panel and I cut it open where there was some detail I expect it to be very much thinner than that on the detailed area now if I'd stretched this with my stretcher I would have made it thinner and then if I polished it, I would have made it thinner again, you see. So you've got to kind of keep your mind on what you're doing, really. So let's change up to something else. Another question that's asked all the time, and if you've ever pondered this question, I think you are on the correct wavelength. So let's put a big dent in this, and I'll discuss what other people ask a lot. So the real thoughtful question posed is, a dent in one side of a panel surely is just a high spot in the other and yet you're telling me different techniques to remove the same scenario well I'm dying to not get too in depth and carried away here and ramble on for an hour and a half so trying to keep it as brief and understandable as possible I would have said that we got to break the problem down into two different observations the first one being access cars are assembled and they're not single panels so gaining access to the inside of something may be very very hard to do so that's the access issue if you think about it i mean it's easy to kind of think in your head about how you could do these things until you actually come to do it and then you suddenly realize you can't get behind you can't reach or there is no way in and that's why a lot of the procedures and uh, tips and tricks that I've shown are shown the way they are so that's kind of the first part of the puzzle is the access issue and the other part is is bodywork is basically a skin over mechanical components and it always runs around the car meaning that all the outer facing surfaces are going to be convex or nearly always convex and this is where the metal behaves in a completely different way just to try and simplify things because I'm itching to get really really involved here but if I just turn this around the other way so now the panel becomes concave a high spot on a concave surface that is shrank will actually become higher because you're reducing the distance between there and there when you shrink it so that dent will increase if you try and shrink it on a concave surface not on a convex on a concave that dent will get worse if you shrink it it will just come up and up and up and up because it's the other way around to what you're used to working with so I hope that answers the question that a lot of people have posed it's been really really hard for me to explain that in terms that I really hope you'll understand if you're still confused I'll try and give uh, a more fleshed out example but I don't want to turn this into a, an hour and a half long feature just on this one thing so hopefully you get your head around what I'm saying there 
I've had many, many questions about access problems. I want to talk about access problems. I mean, you weld a joint and it's all enclosed. You can't get behind to tap it out with a hammer and dolly. And lots of people asking me, how can I get around this? So when I did my van and I welded on the quarter panels, I did a jog or lap joint. Would I do that today? No, I most certainly wouldn't. But I'm very happy with what I did. I put a bit more filler in than I'd like to have, but I would certainly approach the job differently now if I was to do this again. So what I would do is I would take the repair section far higher. So I'd draw this little diagram out for you. So that's where the joggled piece was. That's where the joggled joint is. What I would do is I would take the repair far higher and I would say remove the inner wing because there's not much in that van that's gonna get in the way and other than the inner wing. Now the inner wing would be fairly straightforward to remove because it's only spot welded in in a few places and it also had a lot of rust damage so I could have taken it out, I could have repaired it off the vehicle and then I could have easily gained access to the outer quarter panel through the inside of the van, no problem. Uh, what else can I tie in in this? A lot of people asking me about MIG welding, can we do this uh, planishing out business if we're MIG welding? Well, not so easy because MIG is incredibly hard and it does leave that bead on the inside and the outside that you've got to try and remove before you planish anything out. It is ultra tough as well, meaning that there is a chance that you could actually split the steel when you're planishing it out. It doesn't stretch out anywhere near as easily as if you'd ticked it. Um, have I got anything against MIG? No, not at all. And there are some fantastic people out there that only MIG weld. Fitzy, for instance, and loads of people message me about that guy. He's got a great channel, all he does is MIG welding. I haven't got a problem with it myself. In fact, I MIG welded everything up until just a couple of years ago, and I was chatting to a friend of mine, Tom, who I bigged up his channel last week, uh, Vintage and Classic Metalwork, a great channel and Tom got me on the path to TIG welding through my own frustrations. I was talking to my, I was talking to Tom about my own frustrations with MIG welding and um, he said, well, why don't you try TIG? And he got me onto TIG welding and I do a little bit of TIG welding and a little bit of MIG welding. I mix and match where I think it's appropriate to do a MIG weld or do a MIG weld and vice versa. And it just means that those little frustrations, they're not all gone, but it's sort of, certainly cured a lot of the problems that I had. I think I can really neatly tie up a cluster of questions that are repeatedly being asked. One of the questions often posed is, do I put a heat sink behind a welded joint like a big bar of copper or something like that? Now if you've been watching my videos for any length of time, I've shown this process a few times where I've put a big piece of copper behind a hole to plug a hole up. I find this really, really helpful, but I don't really find it helpful if I'm doing a welded joint. And I'll tell you why, um, and this is, again, this is my own sort of personal opinion on this whole thing. If you put a big piece of copper behind something, you've got to pour so much more energy into it to get it to weld, because welding is basically melting metal together. What temperatures are we looking at? We're looking at, I don't know, somewhere around about 1500 degrees Celsius, something like that. I mean, you can't experientially really know that you're well. Well, that's up to about 1500 degrees, can you? But what I'm saying is, when you put that big piece of copper behind a joint, so if you're trying to do a welded joint, you put that big piece of copper behind, the theory goes, I understand the theory, what they're saying is that that copper will wick away the heat out of the joint, stop it from distorting. The problem is you've got to put so much more power into the weld to get it to actually weld. You're also going to sort of ruin the risk of the underside being cooler than the top side. Because remember, you've got to get that weld to penetrate all the way through the metal. And that's personally, that's why I don't do it. If you do it and you find it helpful, then that's absolutely great. My channel's called Trev's Blog, so I suppose you could say Trev's Opinion really, and they're just tips and tricks videos. And the whole sole purpose of my videos is to help people out that are a bit lost and looking for some help and some guidance. If I've got any advice to offer whatsoever, it's to make sure that the things that you do are the product of your own conclusion. 
While we're still on the subject about heat sinks to wick away the heat, what I have found enormously helpful myself is to put something either side the weld. So I did a video a while back about distortion control while MIG welding and I used two thin strips of wiper cloth soaked in water and put them either side of the weld. So it allowed the welded area to get as hot as it needs to get so that you get the penetration and it gets hot enough but then it stops that heat from spreading into the rest of the panel and keeps the distortion just down to the welded area and not all over the place. So that's the only thing I would say on that. It's something I'd like to explore more with TIG welding, putting some sort of heat sink, because I haven't done that yet. Years ago I used a product called Cold Front, I think it was called, and another viewer wrote to me recently saying that he uses some kind of modeling clay, sort of water-based modeling clay that he puts each side and that works fantastically well, so that's something else I can explore. And what I've tried to do with the TIG welding thing now is literally just to fuse two pieces of metal together, add in a tiny little bit of filler rod, just to try and take out that undercut. Because I'm a bit perverse when it comes to looking at something afterwards, after it's been welded up, I really like to try and aim to get a completely invisible repair. Now, I've worked on many, many hand-built cars some of them as old as 1920 something and the most recent one was probably made in about 2018 something like that so over long long periods of time i've kind of taken the the old paint and the filler off cars to see how they were constructed in their day and people that are coach builders fuse stuff together they rarely use filler rod they get their gaps nice and tight and they just fuse it along they don't put any filler rod in it it's evident because there is no bead sticking out underneath, uh, on the top. There's always plenty of undercut. Now, if you're talking about a sort of person that did professional welding courses and you ask them about this, they'd say, oh no, you absolutely have to add a filler to it. But I'm just saying from experience that these people don't, they just don't do it. I've talked about this before. This was the most fast, productive way of doing it and Let's face it, at the end of the day, if those cars had gone off, been involved in crashes and torn open at the seams, they would have stopped doing it, but it doesn't do that. The bodywork crushes and distorts and compensate for if that sort of joint is slightly weaker, then it certainly doesn't just tear open along the joint. And that's just an observation I've made and I've, I've personally known quite a few coach builders and I've seen their work and most of them don't put filler rod in. Most of them have got very, very obvious joints. Something I've actually been practicing myself is butt welding two pieces of steel together and using a TIG welder and just literally just fusing them along, see how high I can get those amps. And about the highest I've been able to achieve is about 60 amps and just literally just blitzed along, fused the two pieces together, absolutely perfectly flat weld on the top a brilliant penetration. When you look at the underside, it's penetrated all the way along, it's got no bead, absolutely fantastic. The thing is, this is guillotine cut steel along straight lines. When you make a repair section yourself and try and let it into something that's curved and got all sorts of shapes going on, you're invariably going to get the odd gap here and there that you're going to have to sort of slow down and put a bit of filler rod in, otherwise you're just going to end up with a big hole. So one last thing before I wrap this video up, I've also got a few shout outs to make as well. So a bit of fun really, I've been sent a few links over the last couple of years to various other YouTubers channels and also people trying to sell these things called cold welders. What do I know about cold welding? Absolutely nothing, I know nothing about it. But what is evident when I watch these videos that these videos have been in some way cleverly edited. So I've tried to do a reproduction of what I've seen. And um, so I've taken this basic video. So what I've done is I'm kind of spotting along with my TIG welder. So I'm doing spots of weld one after the other. At quite a steady pace, but probably as fast as I can go when you consider that, like I was saying earlier, you know, you need that heat to fuse those pieces of metal together. You've got to get the penetration for the weld to be any good. So you've got to be, a, there's got to be a certain amount of dwell time when you're welding something for that weld to penetrate all the way through. 
There's no way that in the split second that these videos are showing you something, that something can be welded together. So I'll take this video and I'll dissect it. So I'll, I'll take bits out. So the bits I've taken out are going to look like this. So that's the bits that have been taken out. Now what I'll do is, this is the bits that are left, so this is the edited part of the video that I want to keep, and it looks something like this. Now what I need to do is I need to doctor it a little bit more, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the speed of the video so it looks more like this. So this is it running faster, and why don't we put some sound effects on? What about a nice phaser gun? Spring lamb. So, in summing up, yes, I do believe there's a little bit of artistic license going on in some of these videos, but hey, these guys aren't claiming to be anything else anyway, you know, they're just making their videos, so what harm does taking the arc piece out of a video matter anyway? As I said, with regards to cold welding, I know nothing about it, but maybe you guys know more about it than I do. So comments in the comments section, if you know anything about it, I don't. Maybe one day I'll get a cold welder and I'll have a go at it. I'm convinced that some of these videos aren't even edited and this is actually how the welder is working. But what I really find hard to grapple with is how that welder is achieving the penetration needed for the strength and also, I don't like the start-stop thing, if you know what I'm saying. Most definitely first up is Martin Campbell. Now, I've known Martin for several years now, online albeit, and he's a very, very clever and resourceful chap. He's got a YouTube channel, and his latest project on that channel is a motorbike that he's made out of scrap parts. He made the petrol tank. It features two lawnmower engines that have been struck together, and they're two-stroke engines, but he's dressed them up to look like four strokes. Absolutely amazing. Martin will feature later on in another project that I've already completed about paintwork. So I'll be talking more about Martin then. So next up, Yvonne's channel, Yvonne Bingley Bloom, also known as Lady Petrolhead. This is a channel with her husband Carl, the, and they've been building a V8 Stealth Beetle, which is like a kit. I think you can buy it from Brazil, and it has an Audi turbocharged V8 engine in the back, and then you strap a classic Beetle shell on the outside. How absolutely fantastic! Still got to mount the BOV, the blow off valve, and the air mass, which I've got to do when when I lift the body off next. So the exhaust pipes will be coming out. Already featured once before, Madworks Garage. Father and son, John and Benji, make amazing videos and they're basically dragging out old vans from under hedges and old vehicles and resurrecting them, breaking them up, selling them off. Interesting stuff, getting them started. Will this start? 20 years, hasn't run for, etc, etc. So that's Madworks Garage. YouTube channel Auto Lux Resto. A guy got in touch with me a short while back, said please check out my YouTube videos. His latest video is about building his own English wheel again. Uh, quite interesting, he's making it out of MDF to start with, just to make sure everything works and is in the right place before he turns his hand to making it out of steel. Mark Bennett Bowl Creations. Again, I've already plugged Mark once, but well worth a watch. He's a fiberglass man. Me and Mark have talked at length about doing some kind of collaborative project. In fact, I've got something in mind and now I'm starting to get moving with my channel again. I'm sure that I'll be giving him a call shortly and we'll do some sort of collaborative project together. Incidentally, if you're thinking about starting up your own YouTube channel, then why not? What have you got to lose? I find it interesting when I speak to people, the biggest fear is holding them back is ridicule of other people. And the people that are ridiculing them probably haven't got their own YouTube channel and have normally got a massive chip on their shoulder, so I really wouldn't worry about that. 
I'm going to attach a great speech by the late, great Jim Rowan on this subject at the end of the video. Well, thanks very much for watching. Hopefully I'll be back shortly, provided nothing goes wrong. The last couple of weeks I had endless problems. Finally got to the bottom of a Fiat 500 stalling issue, which turned out to be a crank position sensor. So I managed to fit that. The second I fitted that, my son approached me and said, Dad, my car won't start. It turned out to be much more than a flat battery. You have to take half the dashboard apart, take the steering column out and replace a motor in the electronic steering lock. What a nightmare job. Anyway, the other thing that happened was my inverter went pop on the van. Holy smoke, a pretty baby! So, yeah. These things all keep me from making my YouTube videos. So let's hope that nothing else too much goes wrong. Until then, till next time, I'll say bye for now. A magnificent presentation, great presentation. And if you're a student of all, at all, of good communication, it was one of the classic presentations of all time. And it said this presentation was given to a multitude, meaning a lot of people. But it was interesting as the account gives us the record, it says when the presentation was finished, there was a variety of reaction to the same presentation. Isn't that fascinating? I find it fascinating. It said some that heard this presentation were perplexed. And I read the presentation, sounded pretty straightforward to me. He said, why would somebody be perplexed with a good, sincere, straightforward presentation? Best answer I've got. They are the perplexed. I mean, you know, what other explanation is there? It doesn't matter who's preaching. It said some that heard this presentation mocked and laughed, made fun of the presentation. I thought, hey, this looks pretty sincere to me. If you give a sincere, honest presentation, why would somebody mock and laugh? Easy explanation. They are the mockers and the laughers. What else would you expect them to do? Right. I used to try to straighten all that out, say, well, they shouldn't do that. I don't do that anymore. You know, I've got peace of mind now. I can sleep like a baby, not try to straighten all this stuff out. I used to be so naive. I used to say, well, liars shouldn't lie. See, how naive can you be? Of course, they're supposed to lie. That's why we call them liars. They lie, they lie. So I don't straighten this stuff out anymore. Anyway, it said some that heard this magnificent presentation didn't know what was going on. And they're usually easy to spot. They're usually saying, what's going on, right? I mean, they don't know what's going on. But interesting, right? A variety of reaction to the same sincere, honest presentation. Now, it also says in wrapping it up, some that heard the presentation believed. And I think that's who the speaker was looking for, the believers. Interesting. Now, it said the number of believers was about 3,000. So pretty good first day, 3,000. I've had some first days, but I never had 3,000. But anyway, 3,000 were believers. And that's, the speaker was looking for the believers out of this multitude. And that's about as close as we can come to understanding the mystery. Some believe and some mock and some laugh and some are perplexed and some don't know what's going on. And you just have to leave it that way. Why? Because that's the way it's going to be. The way to be brilliant is to find out how it's going to be and then say, here's how it should be. I mean, that's how you become brilliant. So anyway, who knows the mystery? I call it mysteries of the mind. We don't understand, but I don't try to change it anymore. On this particular story, as far as we know, they didn't have classes after the presentation to try to de-perplex the perplexed. I mean, as far as we know, they left them perplexed. They left the mockers mocking. They let the laughers laugh. I mean, they didn't come back and try to straighten all this out. Make another presentation, you'll get some believers and some mockers and some laughers and some who don't know what's going on. So that's about the best we can do. So, but I'm glad I've got the believers here today. You believed enough. So hopefully you'll find some inspiration here today.